It's going to be a little bit short today, probably. Maybe an hour or something. All right, so... Uh, That's good enough. So we're gonna continue with uh, the religious life, right? But what I thought about since last stream is, I mean, it is all connected here with Nietzsche. And also, uh, I, I love how he connects it from the previous chapter. You know, he starts along with this kind of psycho psychologizing it, the whole art and art and uh, religion here. And then slowly now, is getting more and more into Christianity as well and things like that. Christianity and antiquity now, actually. Um, let's see here. All right, so I'm reading Friedrich Nietzsche, Human All to Human, a book for free spirits. R.J. Hollingdale, one of the best translators. And uh, yeah, so in general, this book is more about, you know, you know, it says a book for free spirits. And th that's the thing with Nietzsche, the spirit of the enlightenment, to have this freedom of you, like you don't have any burden of anything and you are curious and you can search for any angle, any, you know, corner you want to search for and, and learn about and, and so forth. He even actually wanted to go back to university at some point with Paul Rey and Louis Salomé. He actually wanted to go back to university almost. Um, if he, that, that in itself feels like modern also. Um, because he, he, he basically took a... Hello, St. Just Germany. <clears throat> he took a, you know, he couldn't do that anymore. So, you know, he was professor, but Nietzsche had to uh, leave at, at Basel University. Basel. Uh, so, yeah, speaking of Germany. <laughs> All right, so I'll continue here with the German philosopher, ph philologist. I would say poet as well. He, he wrote poetry as well. He could uh, play the piano as well. He played music as well. You can actually see it in uh, on YouTube. Uh, someone has actually played and you know his uh, own comp composition. All right, so. Uh, and they feel a bit uh, experimental, to be honest. Like, there is some of this, sometimes it's like a melancholic thing, and then all of a sudden, you know, changes. But that's kind of Nietzsche for you. Um, all right. He loved music. Anyway, <clears throat> that's the thing. Like, he's a philosopher. He loves philosophy. He loves novels. He mentions many times Jonathan Swift. He mentions, uh, who else was it? Uh, he's not just mentioning, you know, um, uh, philosophers. Anyway, ah, yeah, Dostoevsky, but that's later. Uh, that's that's much later. He he stumbles upon Dostoevsky, and he he, he basically says that's his, you know, one of the biggest, uh, well, uh, n not gift, but you know, some sort of, how does he say that? Uh, not miracle, but one of the best, you know, occasions, uh, one of the best, you know, circumstances that has happened to him. One of one of the best things that happened to him, really. Anyway, all right, we will continue now. So he'll delve a little bit more into uh, Christianity now. He 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 put together the whole Dionysus, the festivals and stuff with Christian Easter and mystery plays and stuff in the pre previous 112, and now 113 here aphorism or you know all right christianity and antiquity <clears throat> when a sunday morning we hear the bells ringing we ask ourselves is it possible this is going on because of a jew crucified 2000 years ago who said he was the son of god the proof of such a such an assertion is lacking in the context of our age the christian religion is certainly a piece of antiquity intruding out of distant distant ages past and that the above mentioned assertion is believed while on the otherwise 
while one is otherwise so rigorous in, in the testing of claims, is perhaps the most ancient piece of this inheritance. I think he would have liked modern day discussion about this. Uh, I've read uh, Richard Carrier's, uh, I really like Richard Carrier's book on the historicity of Jesus. So you can already see here, you know, this claim here and testing of, of claims, right? Science, testing of hypo hypotheses. But that's a claim, you know. Um, and, 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 or, or, you know, obviously it can be just, you know, it doesn't have to be so personal all the time, all the hypotheses, but it's still a hypothesis, right? And you can probably test it or you can't test it, but you could test if Jesus is like that. We can test that like, well, not test, but we can use whatever we can, uh, to reach some sort of like, was uh, Jesus a historical person or not? And that's basically actually, he, he's asking that here, right? Um, that he was the son of God, right? Now, obviously, <clears throat> of, of course, like son of God, that's not really what we're testing. We're testing, you know, uh, well, not we, but, but a historian like Carrier, for example. I just love that book. It's quite rigorous actually um but of course we need the opposite opinion as well but i mean based on that book uh there is just there is not much you know uh, for the historicity of of jesus uh, like a historical person uh, he makes a good good case for the mythicist uh explanation but I mean, the truth could still be, you know, he still gives a certain chance for this. I, I believe it was about 30%, something like that, 30 or 33%, uh, I think 30, uh, that he, you know, there is a chance of him being a, a historical person at first, and then maybe it mythicized, you know. Of course, that's very possible, you know. It could have started with this guy and then eventually just, escalated and became something else but but you know the core the origin so to speak was there maybe or you know it could be based on you know these visions and hallucinations or dreams which is quite uh you know when you read paul uh you kind of see there that it seems like it is that way you know he's explaining it that way it doesn't seem like he's met you know Jesus on the language based on the language anyway <clears throat> that's a whole discussion in itself uh, it's been a while since I read that but I remember a couple of things like that um, anyway great book uh, I recommend that one uh, as well if, if people are interested in this whole history city of Jesus uh, Hello, CSDW. There are a lot of philosophers pre-enlightenment that base their philosophy on a Christian context as their thoughts, as their thoughts, not as widespread because of the open and endedness of the Bible. I mean, well, pre-enlightenment, sure. I mean, yeah. Based philosophy on Christian context. Yes, of course. Yeah. That's not something uh, I would you know, go against here. I mean, a lot of people also kind of wanted... Uh, I mean, it depends on what we're looking at here, uh, who, who we're talking about. I mean, you have, like, theologians, like... Uh, Hello, Purple Josh. Uh, today I listened to an essay of Hannah Arendt about freedom. Very interesting. Yeah, Hannah Arendt is also uh, interesting in terms of this whole totalitarian and stuff like that. Uh, totalitarianism. But... Uh, yeah, open-endedness of the Bible. Uh, I mean, open-endedness. Like the Bible claims so many things. You know, it's a, it's a whole cool. The Bible, like the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible as a whole, like that. Uh, but even if you just take the Old Testament, but there is a lot of stories there. There is a lot of things to, you know, you can take a lot of things from that. But the, the philosophy, of course as soon as that started, right, I mean, that is, you know, uh, a development out of that. But usually in the medieval time, like, 
For example, Thomas Aquinas, he tried to fuse basically Christianity with Aristotle. So it's not like they just skipped Aristotle or Plato and you had new Platonists, you have Platonists that, you know, they kept on, well, actually after Plato also, but, you know, keep on building this, you know, principle, God as a principle thing and so forth, which kind of is a little bit what Aquinas does in Summa Theologica, um, where, you know, he's talking about pure act and pure, act, you know, uh, stuff like that. And it kind of sounds more of a, when you look at those arguments like that, it's more of a, you know, purely philosophical, almost, yeah, yeah Pla Platonist uh, version of God, basically. But Aquinas uses, you know, sometimes he uses Bible as a reference, like authority. That, that's why they criticized if you watch my streams with um, um, about uh, meditations by uh, Descartes, meditations on first philosophy, <clears throat> you see there that they, they, some of those priests and theologians and so forth, they criticize him for not using these references like that, like they used to. So he broke, you know, tradition in a lot of ways, Descartes. And and so in Summa Theologica, you can see there that, you know, he has. Uh, you know, Aquinas, for example, he has this, and that's all a background for this. So, you know, you can see a whole, you know, the whole Western philosophy going like that. Now, obviously, um, they got influenced also by uh, Arabic, uh, you know, Islamic as well, because they kept Aristotle, they kept texts like that, and they got new versions. So Aquinas and so forth, they had kind of new versions to work with and so forth. So they were how he was aware of uh, these thinkers of yeah, Muslim thinkers but anyway <clears throat> but it's still a, it's actually not totally correct when they say oh if it wasn't for Muslims we wouldn't have these texts and these and these that that's not really true actually we would have had it but we wouldn't have had as many examples and it would have been harder it would have been harder to a certain extent but and also you wouldn't have obviously the Muslim philosophers so you would have lost that as well but anyway uh, my point is that so those philosophies like still e even in medieval times like you had uh, Thomas Aquinas he's trying to merge these things uh, sometimes it is that sometimes you know you, you have different thinkers of course Don Scotus and so on and um, Oc you know Occam uh, Anselm Sorry, I should have made it clearer. Do people like Aquinas inform modern-day Christianity? Uh, all right. Well, you're talking about something totally different now. Like, inform. Uh, I mean, uh, modern-day Christianity is kind of a just a way of... I mean, first off, modern-day Christianity. I mean, what are we talking about here? And also inform like how do you mean here i mean it's a continuation of this uh some people go back to aquinas but those who are interested i wouldn't say most people in modern day christianity they're not aware of aquinas i mean you know most christians are not aware of that but aquinas is a thinker philosopher theologian maybe he wouldn't have said he wouldn't have seen himself as a philosopher probably but <clears throat> but still he is a thinker you know he, he actively tried to fuse aristotle and and uh christianity and some other people more more you know further into plato and christianity uh, be because a lot of the christian uh even like uh, nietzsche says here christianity itself is in a lot of ways a hellenistic jewish cult in the beginning right it has influences. Uh, for example, one of the clearest language influences here, like a word like logos, that's a Greek word, right? The word, uh, that's logos. I mean, it's deeply tied to this. And you can look at Socrates as a person. It looks a lot like, you know, Jesus. Uh, there are, are influences here. Um, but you can do the same, of course, with even uh, Jewish tradition. tradition if you look at if you look at names and stuff from Egyptian, you know, you have Jeb and stuff like that. And a lot of that, it's still, it's still in the Bible. And 
you know, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, infor right, I mean, it does continue, like modern day Christianity has a lot of those relics with it, you know, but, um, but it kind of a little bit depends on what you're talking about in terms of modern Christianity. I mean, uh, you know, if you're talking about some specific thinker, that's a different thing. Because they would probably have, you know, gone into this and so forth. Maybe, you know, a, a certain Christian thinker today might, you know, be influenced, uh, you know, by uh, Plotinus or, uh, I don't know, Plato and so forth. Uh, or Aquinas and so forth. A anyway, so uh, I don't know if that was what we were, you were thinking of, but, uh, but yeah. The proof of, uh, I mean, there is this connection, you know. It's not like modern-day Christianity is totally separated from this. <clears throat> the proof of such an assertion is lacking, right? The assertion here, let me read a little bit here. <laughs> uh, well, it's the beginning here. So, When on a Sunday morning we hear the bells ringing, we ask ourselves, is it possible this is going on because of a Jew, the modern bells there, uh, because of a modern Jew crucified 2,000 years ago. No, not a modern Jew. <laughs> because of a Jew crucified 2,000 years ago, an ancient Jew, uh, who said he was the Son of God. The proof of such an assertion is lacking. In the context of our age, the Christian religion is certainly a piece of antiquity intruding out of distant ages past. Now, maybe he would say here, here Nietzsche would say here, maybe maybe that is not the truth, right? Um, I mean, uh, it depends on what, what he means here by assertion here, but which assertion. In the context of our age, the Christian religion is certainly a piece of antiquity intruding out of distant ages past, and that the above, well, yeah, there you go, and that the above mentioned assertion is believed, right? While one is otherwise so rigorous in testing of claims, is perhaps the most ancient piece of this inheritance. But he means here more, more, more in terms of he maybe was a, just a, you know, they maybe just made up, you know, Jesus. Or saw, or saw him in dreams and so forth. A God who begets children on a mortal woman, a sage who calls upon us no longer to work, no longer to sit in judgment, but to heed the signs of the imminent end of the world. Right, Christianity has a lot of that, right? Uh, a justice which accepts an innocent man as a substitute sacrifice. Someone who bids his disciples drink his blood. I do think it's stupid to take it literally, the whole drinking his blood. Uh, but there are Christians, uh, through even philosophers and so forth, that have claimed that yeah, you are. I mean, the whole trans, um, subs um, uh, trans substantiation, right? Am I saying that right? Trans sub, yeah, from substantiation, right? Yes. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Exactly. And there are some some who claim that it is literally his blood, like it becomes his blood. But to me, that's a stupid way of uh, interpreting it. They even say somewhere that the learned people understand the metaphors. You know, regular people will have to have more of a... <laughs> right. uh, somewhere, I think it's somewhere in the Bible even. But anyway. Uh, prayers for miraculous, miraculous interventions. Well, yeah. Sin perpetrated against a God, atoned by a God. Fear of a beyond... To which death is the gateway yeah that's also uh, death as the gateway that's old i mean you have um, if you read ancient scroll like obviously i can't read the original scrolls but i have a book here uh, that i've read not a, not the whole thing but because it's kind of the same thing over and over again but these ancient egyptians they prepared all the like for the for the and this is to understand christianity some of it you know you kind of have to understand a little bit of Egyptian stuff as well, like the previous and the previous and the previous. But uh, to understand it a little bit clearer, 
Um, so I would say there is even a line there, you know, not just Christianity in modern, like ancient Christianity in modern, but there is a whole thing there. Uh, but I'm not saying that its influence is the same or that it is the same. I'm just saying, you know, it changed. But but you can see some of those things still here, you know. And, and but this whole beyond to which the gate, like fear of a beyond, right? Uh, fear of death, like afterlife. Although I, I, um, the ancient Egyptians, I wouldn't say they fear uh, the beyond. I, I think maybe they fear death, but well, inst instinct, their instinct did. But you know, um, but in terms of this whole, like they didn't want to die. That's what I mean. But so, so you know, they invented these. You have a lot of spells and helping, like. People helping these, when they are in these tombs here, in ancient Egyptian now uh, times here, you have a tomb, you, you place this king or whatever it is, you know, a royal person, and, um, and it's not whatever it is, you know, it's a royal person. And, and you have a bunch of magic and scrolls and magic they believe in uh, that helping the, if I remember correctly, Ka and um, Ak, you know, a different form of spirit and soul and stuff like that. And together, you know, and, and helping against these monsters and stuff after in the afterlife, you know, so that they can get to, you know, um, with the help of Osiris and the help of all these things like Horus and even Seth, the, the evil one, so to speak, is, it's not the same as in Christianity, really. Uh, they see it as a, you know, a, a necessary thing. Well, maybe even, even Christianity sees it in a certain way as a necessity maybe but but or or just as something that just happens you know the evil in humanity and so forth but but um but th that's the thing like fear of a beyond to which death is the gateway i just immediately thought of this because it is like a gateway there and they have these scrolls these egyptians and helping them after in the afterlife like that and uh, i don't know i just you know, reminding me of that. Fear of the beyond to which death is the gateway, right? The figure of the cross as a symbol in an age which no longer knows the meaning and shame of the cross. How gruesomely all this is uh, wafted to us as if out of the grave of a prim primeval past. Uh, can one believe that things of this sort are still believed in, right? It just means, you know, in general... Um, Kind of, how can we believe in these magic things still, you know? Uh, the unhellenic -Hellen in Christianity, right? So you can, he understood this, you know, the unhellenic in the Christ in Christianity. Uh, although, well, that makes sense, you know, Nietzsche was a philologist after all, but 114, the unhellenic in Christianity. The Greeks did not see the Homeric gods as set above them as masters or themselves set beneath the gods as servants, as the Jews did. Right. They saw, as it were, only the reflection of the most successful exemplars of their own caste. That is to say, an ideal, not an antithesis of their own nature. Right. It's just the ideal, right? You're reaching this. They felt interrelated with them. There existed a mutual interest, a kind of symmetry. Man thinks of himself as noble when he bestows upon himself such gods and places himself in a relationship to them, such as exist between the lower aristocracy and the higher. While the Italic peoples, so Italy back then, but that's not Italy, you know, it's Italic people. While the Italic peoples have a real peasant religion with continual anxiety over evil and a capricious powers and tormenting spirits, uh, right, you, well, well, maybe he is uh, kind of talking about them still. Well, the Italian people have a real peasant religion, right? Like uh, that version of Christianity. With continual anxiety over evil and capricious power, powers and torment, tormenting spirits. Where the Olympian gods failed to dominate, Greek life too was gloomier and more filled with anxiety. That's why he, probably why he uh, associates this whole you know, sort of a suffering thing and stuff like that. Although, well, he does take that from Buddhism as well, but 
Christianity, on the other hand, crushed, well, anti-life thing here. Christianity, on the other hand, crushed and shattered man completely and buried him as though in mud, right? There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's Nietzsche. Into a feeling of total depravity, it then suddenly shone a beam of divine mercy, so that, surprised and stupefied by this act of grace, man gave, gave vent to a cry of rapture and for a moment believed he bore all heaven within him. Right. You know, he, he's not saying it's not powerful. That's not what he's saying. Uh, obviously, it has a, had, has a deep impact on the Western philosophy. Uh, well, Western, you know, the whole thing. Uh, evolution. But I mean evolution as in, you know, development. Uh, it is upon this pathological excess, excess of feeling, a pathological excess of feeling, like an intoxication. That's the intoxication, you know. Upon the profound corruption of head and heart that was required for it. So he sees it as a corruption. That all the psychological, all the psychological sensations of Christianity operate. That all the, it desires to destroy, shatter, stupefy, intoxicate. There you go. The one thing it does not desire is measure. Right. And that is why it is in the profoundest sense barbaric, Asiatic, uh, ignoble, and unhellenic. Because the, the, even, even Socrates and Plato and so forth, they always talked about the golden mean and gold, you know, the measure. And, uh, you know, in symposium, it's a lot about that, actually. Um, but, um, but, yeah, this is obviously Nietzsche. But at the same time, later, Nietzsche will go against even this in some sense because, well, he will go against a part of you know, he's not going against Socrates totally, but, you know, in Antichrist, uh, that is one of his uh, more, if I remember if it was Antichrist or Twilight of the Idols. <laughs> but there he goes against, you know, Socrates as well. He will get there, you know, uh, slowly but surely, <laughs> he'll criticize everything, basically, more or less. Not really everything, not the Hellenic uh, in a lot of ways. Maybe in some ways even the Hellenic, but mostly not. And mostly not the Renaissance uh, and so forth. Anyway. 115. The advantage of being religious. There are sober and industrious people to whom religion adheres like a bordering of higher humanity. Such people do, do well to remain religious. It beautifies them. All, so you see, he, he always tries to find, you know, just because he goes against... There is sometimes where he's not doing that. Does he also go against Aristotle and Machiavelli? Um, he's not really Aristotelian, I would say. Yeah, um, Machiavelli. Um, uh, I, I think he drops a lot of this Lady Fortuna and, and uh, some of that stuff, but he won't drop all of Machiavelli. You will see. Uh, he mentions um, Cesare Borgia. He mentions stuff like that, the same as Machiavelli. So he is influenced by Machiavelli a lot there. Um, it is this power thing there. And uh, But Aristotle, I mean, I can't think of anything super specific right now. Um, but there is a lot of it he's just against there, against both Plato and Aristotle and so forth. Although there are, there are kind of some similarities in terms of politics, I would say. Like, they're both against democracy, actually. But they were all kind of against, you know, Aristotle, Aristotle was against democracy as well. Um, but almost for the same reasons a little bit, you know, this whole mediocrity thing. And also, well, it can also always get corrupt, but any, anything can get corrupt, you know. Uh, but Nietzsche says somewhere, you know, it's better to have a tyrannical, you know, a leader, but instead of this, you know, mediocrity. But, you know, I appreciate it when someone criticizes their mentor influence. Yeah. So, but to Nietzsche, it's not Aristotle. Then it, it would be more, um, it would be more Plato or um, 
Socrates actually, which he does criticize a lot, especially he gets it all back, returns it all into Socrates. That the whole, the whole, you know, it went too much Apollonian, so to speak. It went too much rational and, and lost a little bit of the Dionysian, right, with Socrates. That, that's his problem with Socrates there. And he can see a little bit of this Christianity coming from Socrates there. And there is a lot of truth in that. So, uh, yeah, but yeah, Aristotle and Plato, exactly. Uh, I like that as well. Like, you, it has to happen, you know. Otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> but Nietzsche did that with Schopenhauer. He's doing that, actually, in this book. Uh, Schopenhauer, more and more, uh, and uh, which is one of his bigger, biggest, you know, influences. Uh, one influence he doesn't go against, as far as I... Well, a little bit, maybe, about the character thing. But Heraclitus, he's also inspired by Heraclitus. He doesn't totally go against, you know, he's always praising him, almost always. Um, the only thing is this whole character thing. But that's also a word, you know, semantics a little bit here. Because it depends on how we interpret it, interpret Heraclitus as well. Anyway, uh, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that, that's, that's that. But yeah, there, there is a lot of this, you know. First you are, you know, you like your, he will always like them. It's not like he doesn't like, you know, this and that person. But, and he drew, you know, he drew stuff from them, but he has to go, he says this as well, like you got to distance yourself from these, your idols uh, at some point, you know. Uh, anyway, 115 here. And you got to do that. Otherwise, how are you going to be your own, you know? 115. Advantage of being religious. All right. <laughs> I already... Ah, no. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah. Did I start it? Uh, start this one? Uh... <clears throat> All right. Yeah, I did begin reading this. Boarding of higher humanity. Such people do well to remain religious. It beautifies them. Right. All men incapable of wielding some kind of weapon or other, mouth and pen included... Uh, mouth and pen included as weapons become servile for this Christianity is very useful for these people uh, for within Christianity servility assumes the appearance of a virtue and is quite astonishing, astonishingly beautified people whose daily life appears to them too empty no people whose daily life appears to them too empty and monotonous easily become religious there you go this is understandable and forgivable so you see, you know, that's why you can't go with Nietzsche like, oh, it's all just this and all that, just that. This is understandable and forgivable. Only they have no right to demand religiosity of those whose daily life is not empty and monotonous. I totally agree, actually, there. But also, maybe we, we have less and less of this. So, uh, you know. Depends on where you are, of course. 116. Uh, let me just check something here. Uh, 116 here. The everyday Christian. If the Christian, so so the every like he, he says, you know, I can understand these the regular people in terms of you know life is just monotonous, you know. Uh, it's not like they are philosophers, and so it is understandable that they become heavily or easily religious, as he says. But they can't demand of other people that uh, to be the same way. You know, that's what he doesn't like. There, one hundred and sixteen. The everyday Christian. If the Christian dogmas of a revengeful God, universal sinfulness, election. So there is that revenge he doesn't like also. So you should criticize Nietzsche, yes. Or Peterson at least. Well, yeah, I, I have, you know, uh, it's not like I agree everything uh, with, with Nietzsche here. I don't do that. But there is a lot of wisdom to take from Nietzsche. Peterson, on the other hand, uh, I'm very critical of Peterson. <laughs> uh, I've never been a 
fan of beers. Or anything like that. Or fan, you know, I don't... I'm so, uh, you know, I, I don't think of it as fandom or, you know... You just, you're either influenced or you're, you know... Or you're not. Um, but I, I did have a time where I tried to figure out Peterson's philosophy. And uh, I don't know, I, I think I have a general grasp of it, but I don't think it's that, you know, I don't think he's doing anything new there. Uh, you know, what, what's new with Peterson? I'm not so sure there is anything new there. Uh, you know, like maybe getting back that, you know, metaphysical, well, but, but that's, you know, impossible. 116, the everyday Christian. If the Christian dogmas of a revengeful God, universal sinfulness, election by divine grace, and the danger of everlasting damnation were true, it would be a sign of weak-mindedness and lack of character not to become a priest. Right. If they were true, it would be a sign, right? If they were true, it would be a sign of weak-mindedness and lack of character not to become a priest, apostle, or a hermit, and in fear of and trembling to work solely on one's own salvation, right? Which is really more, that own salvation there is more uh, Nietzsche there, right? Existentialism, agreed, it's basically existentialism, yeah. Well, uh, it's existentialism if you include a bunch of Christianity. Well, we could say, you know, Kierkegaard, Selvin Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard, as they say in English. Picking up your life, facing your fears. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's so simple, so general statements as well. Like, facing your fear. I understand he has to talk about it to, to many people, but, you know, it, it would be interesting to see what he would say, like, in a specific scenario. Like, how do you face that fear? Uh, you know, I would want to hear his, his words. Maybe he has done that. I've, I haven't seen everything by Peter. I watched a couple of lectures years ago. Maybe like two or three years ago about where he became this thing, you know. I think it was 2017 or 16. Um, but, you know, um, but but I get this feeling like he, he, he thinks he's doing this Christ-like thing, almost like what Nietzsche describes here, this whole like intoxication thing. You can you can almost see it in I've seen some of those videos there where he's where he says, you know, I am trying to bear the cross like the same way uh, almost said Nietzsche, <laughs> the same way uh, Jesus did, you know. And to me that's all just, you know, uh, he's more of a psychologist, I believe. Yeah, he is a psychologist, but he's venturing into these things, and I think we have a, you know, kind of a right. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter if he, he does or doesn't, you can still criticize his ideas, even if he's just a psychologist. It's not just, you know, uh, but because he's talking about also a lot of things. Yeah, picking up where Nietzsche left, lol, right. And, and that's totally wrong. Like, you're, you're not picking, he's not picking up where Nietzsche left it, you know? <laughs> uh, not even close, because Nietzsche would say, what are you doing? You're going backwards, you know? He mentions that in all, Human Also Human, for example. Well, he mentions that later as well. Like, he does mention it, that, you know, it's not about going back, it's about forward. And, uh, you know, find find more grounded way of, you know, uh, a meaningful life. And not be afraid. Like, that is a fear. That is in itself a fear, you know, to go back to Christianity, to go back to the metaphysics or whatever he wants, you know, the metaphysical substrate, I remember him saying. <laughs> and But that is cowardly. Isn't that cowardly? Like... And, and even if it isn't, then I, I want to have a, I want, I want a great explanation here, a deep explanation of why it isn't, and in a fundamental way, why it isn't, and tie it to, to this 
not just sex, like to everything. Uh, well, to to life at least and, and uh, humanity. I think that's the wrong mentality as well. Yeah. Yeah, it is. You know. Like, what's his goal, Peterson? What what is his goal? To reinterpret everything. Let, let's say with the Bible lectures. Like, what's the goal here? To reevaluate everything through looking back at the Bible, and uh, you know. There is so much there that we've moved way, you know, way beyond. Don't intimidate someone influential, <laughs> right? <clears throat> I mean, to me, it's it's um, it's going back and not just back, but it is still the you know it's still establishment. You know, most people still believe. Most people are Christian and Muslim. So, you know. But of course, he looks up this whole the nihilism that happened and so forth. Like Nietzsche foresaw this nihilism that came, you know, super socialism and so forth and so forth, or Nazism and so forth. But, uh, It's not as easy to just put it that way. And, and also, um, and also, sure, there is a problem, but the problem is not by artificially taking, reviving this dead corpse, you know. That's not the solution. That has never been the solution. Like, if you want to fix a modern plane, you don't go back to ancient planes, you know. You try, you find new, new you, you have new problems, new problems arise, and you fix them with new solutions. You, you can't use a, you can use old wisdom, but you can't really use old knowledge like that. There is no, we're never, physicists today, they never look at Aristotle's physics, you know, unless they're just interested in, you know, obviously, history of ideas. He should focus more on creating his own thing. Exactly, right? Exactly. Uh, for example, I would like to, like, even if he's doing this metaphysical stuff, then develop this metaphysics and show us the truth. You know, like, what is this metaphysics? You know, can we doubt it? Or it's like impossible to doubt this and so forth. Even if it were to fail, at least try something new. Exactly, exactly. Copy paste. <laughs> Copy paste. <laughs> it takes from uh, some sort of a Neoplatonist and just copy paste. But no, uh, but that, that's not what I would want from him. Uh, you know, like like develop the thing. You know, I think he's a little bit confused in terms of like he has this whole, you know. Uh, so people say uh, self-help <laughs> thing, uh, but but so it becomes a little bit more focused there. Maybe you know, I don't know, I don't know. But yeah, right now it it doesn't seem like he's it doesn't seem very well, you know, in terms of health. So I don't know if we will ever see anything more from him, or except I heard something about a new book, but. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, so so let me just re re read more here. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure he has the knowledge to create something new. Yeah, exactly. You know, and be precise. You know, <laughs> follow your own advice and be precise. He doesn't need to rely on all older thinkers. Exactly, you know. If you are, if you are, you know, uh, you are your own here. Of course, you're influenced. It will always be that, but that's every thinker. Um, because it's impossible. You're not born. <laughs> you're not born a philosopher. Um, everyone has has someone before, or uh, well, almost everyone. Well, even Heraclitus said, you know, he's a, he was self-learner. 
but he, he learned through reading other people or, or talking to and so forth. So, or also learned from nature itself, from experience. You know, you're never born in a total isolation. Clean up your room. <laughs> yeah, uh, my room is actually pretty clean, always. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, clean up your room. It's so simplistic. Like, is that it? You know, like clean up your room. Is that it? Is that? Uh... And when he sometimes goes goes into this, like. It is something like, he says, you know, something like pick up the burden and, you know, forward with it like a hero, you know, like, or, or something, slay the dragon and take that, you know, treasure and get it back. But, you know, something like that. But is that it? Like, haven't we come further than just mythologies and so forth? Have you seen the clip where Ben Shapiro is being threatened by a trans on live TV? Uh, I don't, I don't think I've seen that. Is that recent or is that something old or recent? I've seen a little bit of Shapiro. I've seen a little bit of uh, his interviews on mainly on uh, Dave Rubin. Uh, Dave Rubin. He's a, uh, he's, uh, you know. When I was on Twitter, uh, I criticized Rubin a lot there. But, you know, obviously who cares about some tweets? You will go home in an ambulance. Never, never knew they did these things. Bring you home. So, so this is recent, right? You will. I mean, it's terrible. It doesn't matter who it is. Like, that's what I said in some previous stream, right? It doesn't matter if you're trans, homosexual. I don't care. Like, you can still be a, you know, terrible person, or an immoral person, whatever, whatever you want to call this. You can still. We can forget about those labels. Just, you can still hurt a person. You can still, uh, you know, physically hurt. And it uh, doesn't matter who you are. And uh, to me, that's always wrong because there is always something to gain. And even from the opposite, you know, it's like Hitchens said, you know, when the four horsemen, when they talked this old, you know, video, 2006 or whatever it was, seven, you had Hitchens, Dennett, Harris, and Dawkins, right? And Hitchens said, Hitchens said, almost all of them, like Dawkins was like, they had this question of, would you want Christianity to disappear? And Hitchens was, I think he was the only one that said, no, I wouldn't want it to disappear, actually, Christianity. Because he's the against here. He's the conflict. He likes conflict. And he likes conflict because, because, I, I think, like, my interpretation of this and the reason behind, behind this. I, I didn't, I don't say that Hitchens, I'm not sure he understood it, this, but, or understood it this way, but this is my understanding. Uh, that the conflict gives out, you know, these possibilities. And so it gives new routes, it gives new, you know, perspectives, it gives new truths or untruths but something we can, you know, uh, look at. Not really, but it's quite funny as everyone is angry at him in the studio. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Ben Shapiro. Uh, I think a lot of his ideas are... Uh, I don't know. He, he's also conservative and, you know, he wants to stay here all the time. And what's the point of that, you know? They always get shouted at for having an extreme opinion. Do you think he has a point? Political correctness. I mean, Shapiro has a point. I mean, if they are violent, then obviously um, he has a good point there. Um, in terms of suppressing truth, which is what I think political correctness is at the bottom, um, then yeah, totally against that because... We need the conflict there. Um, uh, it's almost ironic there. Like we have the conflict from them. But luckily we, in the West, we still have in our laws, you know, this. But, but it is fragile. This whole, you know, we have a right to, you know, uh, freedom of speech. 
And that's, that's, that's something we have from Enlightenment era, right? Maybe, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. And those ideas, that idea of freedom of speech, a right to opinion and being opinionated. And, and so you can't really, by law, you can't suppress, you know, it doesn't matter how, how much of a Nazi you are, uh, by law, you can't suppress Nazis and their ideas. What you can, of course, is, you know, you can get rid of, uh, you can't outlaw racism. Well, you can to a certain extent, you know, discrimination laws and stuff like that. But you can't really, in the inner life of a person, really say, you know, you have to be this and that. That's impossible. And it's always going to be impossible. Well, maybe not always, but as long as we live here, at least, it's always going to be impossible. Because you can still believe whatever you believe, even if they torture you and kill you and so forth. People being afraid of being called a racist or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there are points to that. A lot of these, some people in this group, click, uh, they kind of are this, you know, they have this fear. And it, but it, it's a perceived fear. Uh, it itself, you know, this whole leftism, whatever, political correctness, is itself just a bunch of ideas as well, right? Uh, and not just ideas, but they take it to themselves, right? They identify with this the same way as in religion, anything like that. Even saying, you know, I'm Nietzschean, you know, you, I, you start identifying there. But the reason why I'm doing that is a different, you know, the reason there is that I can see a lot of wisdom there. You can relate to a lot of it and so forth. But, uh, but that's, it doesn't mean that I'm not, going against him, you know, I, I can go totally against, you know, Nietzsche. That's the thing. They don't have that mentality. A lot of people, left, right, I mean, it's both left and right. A lot of people don't have, you know, there is a different kind of political correctness with conservatives. Um, you know, uh, in, in a lot of ways. But, but you know, it's, it's and also all these claims about Christian values and stuff, so forth. Uh, but, you know, as, as if everything is just from the seed of Christianity. Even the seed of Christianity is actually Hellenic Jewish. So it's not totally, you know, it's not Christian. You know, Christian is Hellenic Jewish. People being afraid, but yeah. But, but this whole fear thing, like, and racist, being called racist, that is a fear. Like, a, that's a social thing. That's a social pressure. And probably within these... You know, let's say leftist. Within these people, their group and their group of friends, they probably also have this mentality of, of you know, uh, political debates, yikes, yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but, but their own group, like, they probably fear what their friends would say about them and their friends would hate them or, you know, excommunicate. <laughs> Uh, they will distance themselves from them um, if they, you know, will be perceived as racist and so forth and so forth and so forth. So there is, of course, there is definitely a fear there. Always drama and pretty much this, exactly. To me there, I mean, if you've seen a little bit of this, you'll just see this tribal stuff and you can see those, it's almost like Machiavelli there, you know, like power... <laughs> Ironically, what some leftist says, but you can see that stuff in them as well. You know, the whole power thing, the power power perspective. Each group criticizing the other for being wrong and why they are right. Exactly. But but also, almost always, each group, you know, turning a blind eye to their own criticism of their own group. And that's the problem. And that's why it's all about individuality. And that's why even Nietzsche says here, you know, individual salvation, he says. And that's why Nietzsche always zeroes in on individuality as well. He understood this. That's why he said, I'm the anti-political, you know, like, I hate both, you know, social and conservative. He did that, you know. He didn't say those words, but, well, he says social, socialists, he criticizes those, and then he criticizes nationalists, conservatives. 
as a civilian, you are meant to see through this BS. Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of people, I think most people aren't as this extreme left. But I think a lot of right people, uh, you know, these conservatives, a lot of them also, you know, uh, I feel like you see this in American politics a lot. Yes, exactly. Well, I think a lot of European politics has been very influenced, and not just politics, but culture, from our American culture. And uh, so, and internet is making this, you know, it becomes this a little bit of Americanized thing. Although when Corona happens, <laughs> you can kind of see like, all right, it's not really the same thing, you know, there are factors here. It's not the same uh, amount of debt everywhere and so forth. And why is that? Well, geography, culture, this and that, you know. And and um, so you see the differences. But yeah, American culture is a American culture is a lot of this. My group versus your group. It's increasingly. I think you can see in those Pew, uh, what's it called? Pew Research, right? Pew Research. Um, you can see there that those um, with those diagrams and stuff statistics there is more and more of a divide there like people turning more and more this way or this way and uh, that's why Nietzsche that's the thing you know Nietzsche doesn't go this way or this way well in politics mm, 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 you know no way here <laughs> it's, it's just like he's wanna, he wants the truth but you know, um, he doesn't believe that there is this ultimate... And, and it, it is true because all of this bickering in today's politics, I mean, in a hundred years, in a thousand years, this will all be stupid. All of it. I mean, nearly all of it will be so stupid and just nothing. The same way that we don't think about, you know, much about politics in antiquity, except, of course... In general terms, you know, uh, maybe looking at, you know, some inspiration and looking at how they built this and that. Or not just inspiration, but, you know, wisdom, inspiration. Or, or, um, or understanding where we came from and blah, 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 and so forth. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, there is a lot of nonsense there. It's almost, like you said, you know, drama and, and yeah, scoring... It's about scoring points as well. Yeah. It is like a gossip thing, you know? It's almost like gossip, scoring points, competition, sports. Although sport, there is a positive, you know, there is a healthy, uh, you know, obviously sports is healthy, but this mentality is not healthy. Uh, having the guts to insult someone badly. Yeah. And internet just makes it even more, you know, you can be anonymous. And it just exacerbates everything sometimes. A lot of times. Twitter Twitter has become this political place, right? I used to be there. Uh, but, um, yeah, politics is an unhealthy sport. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There you go. Exactly. It's an unhealthy sport. It's a, such a stupid thing. And also, much of this doesn't matter at all in terms of power, in terms of policies, in terms of <laughs> uh, politics, you know, from diplomats and people, you know, talking to other people and countries and, you know, diplomat from China plus, you know, well, with a European or whatever. And, and this whole discussion that Shapiro talks about, like, it has nothing on this at all, really. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of stupid on a lot of levels. But, you know, there are much more dangerous stuff. Like, of course, you can say that, well, we're, we, we shouldn't just think of the most dangerous stuff. You, you can also think of the small problems. Yeah, but 
uh, you can think of the small problems and also put it into a perspective uh, you know uh, but anyway and like you said it is unhealthy you know or like we said uh, harshly as Christian uh, did I say everything here 116 uh, how, how far have I whoops whoops one hour I'm not gonna go for very long or longer uh, but a little bit longer um, all right let's read a little bit Nietzsche here uh, <laughs> 116 like, like for just one more thing like so emergency stuff or you know um, corona obviously I want to be a little bit I want to know what that is all about and so forth but and also you, you gotta but that, that's a different thing you know um, that concerns every single human being the corona doesn't care if you're rich or poor or who you are it doesn't matter leader or not leader so uh, that's kind of the beauty of nature actually 116 the everyday Christian if the Christian dogmas of a revengeful God universal sinfulness election by divine grace and the danger of everlasting damnation were true it would be a sign of weak-mindedness and a lack of character not to become a priest right and many people can't really be in this you know putting themselves in this shoes of these and that's what to me a true philosopher is someone that can do that see you another time good sir uh, i am about to have dinner take care all right uh, have a great dinner uh it's always fun to talk to you and uh yeah, I'll see you soon again, Purple Josh. And uh, yeah, have a great uh, evening and yeah, great dinner. See ya, see ya soon. And I'll continue a little bit here. Uh, so yeah, like Nietzsche is, Nietzsche is, you know, now he's reverting it and looking, you know, if it is true, then obviously in their eyes, uh, it is weak-mindedness and lack of character not to become a priest or apostle or hermit. And I, I would say, like, if I was a Christian, I mean, you, you would have to go all in if you're really, truly believing, you know, going totally all in like that. Actually, a priest told me uh, I would be a good priest when I was young. <laughs> but, uh, not become a priest, uh, apostle or hermit, and in fear and trembling, to work solely on one's own salvation, right? You see, that's more than each other. It would be senseless to lose sight of one's eternal advantage for the sake of temporal comfort. Comfort. Well, that's 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 true, you know. I mean, if that's true, then that's true, you know. Of course, like the temporal, like why, you know, why even talk about? Why not just devote everything to this? Because that's the everlasting, you know. If that is the everlasting. Uh, but if you believe that, then that is it, that. You know. If we assume that these things are at any rate believed true, then, then the everyday Christian cuts a miserable figure. He is a man who really cannot count to three and who precisely on account of his spiritual imbecility does not deserve to be punished so harshly as Christianity promise, promises to punish him. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, they're not... Well, that's a, 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 he's not really a um, miserable figure, right? Then the everyday Christian cuts a miserable figure. Did I say miserable? Uh, he's a man who really cannot count to three, right? Who precisely on account of his spiritual imbecility does not deserve to be punished so harshly as Christianity promised to punish him. 117. Yeah. Of the prudence of Christianity, among the artifices, of Christianity, it is that of proclaiming the complete unworthiness, sinfulness, and despicableness of man in general so loudly that to despise one's fellow man becomes impossible. To despise one's fellow man becomes impossible. Let him sin as he may, he is nonetheless not essentially different from me. It is I who am in every degree unworthy and despicable, 
Thus says the Christian to himself. But this feeling too has lost its sharpest, sharpest sting because the Christian does not believe uh, in his individual uh, dis uh, despicability, dis despicabil despicableness, right? <laughs> but this feeling too has lost its sharpest sting because the Christian does not be believe in his individual despicableness. He is evil as a man as such and uh, quietens his mind a little and he, he is evil as a man as such, you know, in general, and quietens uh, his mind uh, and quietens his mind a little with the proposition, we are all of one kind. Right. Well, even Heraclitus says that, but, uh, you know, it's way in the past as well. So. Uh, 118 here. Change of kind. Well, also it depends on how you see this one of kind. There are different kinds, but really, you could say, like, really we are. But 118 here. Change of caste. As soon as a religion comes to dominate, it has its it has as its opponents all those who would have been its first disciples. The change of caste. As soon as a religion comes to dominate, it has, it has as its opponents all those who have who would have been its first disciples. Well, that's an interesting aphorism, actually. Hundred nineteen. Destiny of Christianity. You would think it's not like that, but destiny of Christianity. Christianity came into existence in order to lighten the heart, but now it has first to burden the heart so as afterwards to be able to lighten it. Exactly. Consequently, it will perish. Right? Because that, that's the thing. You can already see here in, in 17, like I read here, the despicableness, you know, against life, you know. That's what Nietzsche says later. And he says already here, but he will say more in terms of Christianity is like basically anti-life. You know, going against the pleasures of life and pleasures of this and that here. You know, it's anti-Epicurean. And it makes sense because they actually, and they did understand this, the Christians, because later Christians, because they didn't save. They would have taken care of, you know, Epicurean texts and so forth. But all they did was, of course, Plato and, you know, Aristotle to a certain extent, but mainly Plato. And, uh, you know, some Christians even think that Plato had this preordained, like a pre-Christian awakening thing. He could kind of see it, see it happening or something. Uh, but yeah. But he, Nietzsche says, consequently, it will perish because, um, you know, it, it can only lighten the heart if you also believe in the afterlife. It first burdens the heart in life, right? And only so as to afterwards be able to lighten it, right? Consequently, it would perish. Proof by pleasure. Now, let me get to blind pupils and then we'll end it here for today. Um, proof by pleasure, 120. The pleasant opinion is taken to be true. This is the proof by pleasure, or as the church put, puts it, the proof by power. You know, almost like ad populum. Nietzsche is philosophy. Yes, Nietzsche is philosophy. Uh, this is the proof by pleasure. Or, as the church puts it, the proof of power, of which all religions are so proud, though they ought to be ashamed of it. If the belief did not make the blessed, if the belief did not make blessed, it would not be believed. How little then will it be worth? Right. Uh, yeah. 121 here. Dangerous game. Uh, dangerous game. Anyone who now, anyone who now again makes room for religious sensibility within himself, will then have to allow it to grow. He cannot do otherwise. As a consequence, his nature will gradually change. It will come to prefer that which adheres to and dwells beside the religious element. The entire horizon of his judgment and sensibilities will be clouded around, and religious shadows will flit across it. Sensibility cannot stand still. Therefore, let's let us take care, right? Take care and be careful there. And you know, he says dangerous game. Uh, 
yeah, I will end it there. Uh, that's, you know, I think I've we discussed a little bit, you know, politics and stuff, but, you know, modern day situation. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. We'll get to more Nietzsche next time. Um, but so, yeah, uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. Follow. You can go to the, you, you can vote for next book I should read. Uh, it's either in here, uh, in the info page, or uh, if you're in the app, it should be here in, in the chat. But yeah, that's it. And um, we'll continue next time. Tomorrow, actually. And in the future, I might actually just do three days or something like that. Um, uh, because, uh, I don't know, you know, I feel like I need a better balance and, uh, yeah, to have time to, you know, uh, but yeah, that's it. That's it. And, um, I will see you tomorrow.